Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? We're good. Are we awake? Wide awake? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Yeah? A couple of weeks ago, um, I was trying to think about, well, I was praying and just, what shall I speak about? What shall I bring tonight? And last, last week, I, w- I wasn't really sure that I'd heard from God because I thought, I can't bring this because it's not very encouraging. And like, messages are meant to encourage you, aren't they, right? <laughs> and then if you were here last week, Philippa preached. I don't remember Philippa's preach. Yeah. Yeah. And it was epic. It was amazing. And it was spot on with what God was saying to me. And Philippa just brings it all confidently. I, I, I heard the voice of God. I know what I should bring. And I'm, and I'm there like, well, I don't really know if I even heard him. But, um, but Philippa just really confirmed a little bit of what I think God wants to speak to us tonight. Um, Philippa spoke on the wall in a marathon, right? You run a marathon and apparently, I've never done it, um, you might, I get this when I run up the stairs, but you hit a wall. <laughs> and basically, it's kind of like halfway um, b- between the marathon, and, and everything tells you when you're running that I can't do this. It's impossible. I can't carry on. And you think, why did he even run? Why did he even take up running? And I- I'm never going to finish this race. And then you meant to push through the wall and persevere and then finish the race. Does that? Sound familiar? Do we know what I'm talking about when I say a wall? Not a physical wall, just like something. And Philippa said to us, shock, horror, sometimes a Christian life's a little bit like a wall. Yeah? You you, you kind of hit a wall and you you think, why did I even do this? You know, why am I even, how am I ever going to do, I feel so weak, I feel like I can't push through, I feel like I'm never going to finish this race. I feel like I I can't do it. And we've got to persevere, haven't we? Push through the wall and finish the race. That's a brilliant message from Philippa. And so we're going to carry on a little bit um, in that sort of theme tonight. And we're going to look at what it means to follow Jesus. So if you'd like to go to Matthew chapter 16... So, um, <clears throat> Matthew 16 from verse 13. We got it? It says, um, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. So, firstly, Caesarea Philippi isn't where Jesus and his disciples hang out. Isn't where they hang out. They they hang out at the Sea of Galilee in Jerusalem. This is 25 miles north of where Jesus and his disciples normally hang out. And so Jesus has taken them basically on a two-day walk. If you know where Huddersfield is, yeah, Manchester to Huddersfield, Jesus takes them on a two-day walk. And The reason Jesus did this is because he needs to kind of get away from all the religious authorities and and, and because he's about to talk about something really serious. He's about to talk about how he's the Messiah and even to claim that was dangerous. So he had to go 25 miles out of the way just to ask them a question. What's he say? Okay, Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is. Jesus is is asking his disciples, hey guys, you've been around me for quite a long time now, and what's what's the word on the street? What are people saying? Who, Who do people say I am? The most important question you will ever ask or be asked is, who am I? By Jesus. And the most important question you'll ever answer is that, it's the most important question you'll ever answer. Um, it's really important just to say here, Jesus isn't being insecure. He's not like, um, hey guys, who are, what, what are people saying about me? You know, did, did, did they see when I healed the blind guy? 
Did they see that? Did, did, did people see that? No, Jesus is basically saying, um, hey, do, hey have people, do people know how awesome I am? Have they seen how awesome I am? Have they seen that I'm the son of man? Have they seen that? They replied, verse 14, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? I don't care what other people think, I don't care what other people say. Jesus says, and he says it to us tonight, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? What's your heart say? Who do you say that I am? Jesus probably knew what they were going to say, but um, it's really important, isn't it, when we say things out loud and we confess them. Watch what Peter says. Peter nails it. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, but by my Father in heaven. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God, and you're the fulfillment of the whole story. Jesus, I I recognize you. You're the thing that everything was pointing to. You're the Messiah. Jesus says, well done, Peter. Fantastic. Um, You didn't listen to what other people said. You didn't gather all your data up and do your your research, your market research, and, and try and find out who's this Jesus guy, but... My father revealed it to you, and you responded out of your heart. Well done, Peter. Let's say, well done, Peter. Peter did well. Peter did very well. He's going to just ruin it, but right now, he did really well. My father revealed it to you. You know, witnesses and testimonies are not revelation. So the Bible, the Gospel of Matthew, and what Peter says, his declaration Without these things, okay, we wouldn't know about Jesus. That's true. But we, we need to know him personally. We need to know him personally. If others say, Jesus is the Messiah, that's not why I believe it, is it? Right? Each of us needs a revelation. Each of us needs to not just be told, but to be shown. We need to see it. We need to see it individually, all of us in this room. We need to see Jesus. We need to have that revelation. You can't rely on mine. You can't rely on someone else's. We all need it individually. This is why it's, it's so important that we're not churchgoers. We're Christ followers, right? We, we, we don't just go to church, do we, on a Sunday, and, and that's who we are. No, we believe in Jesus. We follow Jesus. And guess what? The church just extends. It's beautiful. You meet people who follow Jesus. You don't meet churchgoers. And so Peter, in this moment, has a revelation. His brain catches up with his heart. All of what he's seen of Jesus, right? He's been walking with him, learning from him. It just dawns on him, and it clicks. And he says, you're the Messiah. I've I've just had the revelation. That's who you are. It's really powerful. This is how powerful it is, look, when we have a revelation of who Jesus is. Are you ready? Verse 18. This is what Jesus says. When we, all of us in this room, we have that revelation, Jesus says this to you. And I tell you, put your name here. I tell you, Peter, I say to you, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Okay? And don't go around, you know, you might get killed. Um, Jesus knew who he was. And Peter knew who he was because he knew Jesus. Right? He knew Jesus was the Messiah, and now Peter knows he's a rock. Um, He knows who he is because he knows who Jesus is. Um, Whenever any of us declares Jesus as Messiah, whenever you or me, whoever, right? When we have that revelation and confess, Jesus says, build my church. Yeah? Jesus says, build my church. When we declare Jesus as Messiah, we basically just say, um, I want to be part of this building project. Yeah, we enlist ourselves onto a building project when you say Jesus is Messiah. Um, and when you confess it, wait for it. 
we've got work to do. We've got lots of work to do, plenty of work to do. Um, and we've got work to do in this community. We've got people to reach. We've got projects to get involved in. We've got all sorts of things. We've got Alpha coming up. We've got stuff like that coming up in the future, sort of September onwards. We've got loads of stuff to get involved in. We've got work to do. We've all, individually, got work to do. Um, and we are building his church continuously because the enemy wants to tear it down. That's why we've got to build it. So Peter, top of the class, he's doing really well. Jesus says you're blessed. Peter says you're God's anointed king, you're the Messiah. Um, but Peter and the other disciples are probably thinking the kingdom's going to look a little bit different. They're probably thinking, right, okay, Jesus, you've given us this authority. Let's go get thousands of soldiers. Let's march on Jerusalem. Let's take down the current government administration. Let's bring your kingdom, Jesus, your King Jesus. Let's destroy him. Let's kill these Romans. Let's get rid of the wicked Jewish priests. And let's, re- let's bring the kingdom. That's what Peter was probably thinking. Bring it. Don't just sing it. Verse 21, something epic happens, right? They have this shift in their thinking, a shift in their expectations, a shift. And and there's a massive shift in how the world views power and the kingdom. Jesus is just about to unleash this. Verse 21, from that time on, this is literally just, we just read verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside, I like this, really confidently, you're the Messiah in front of everyone. Jesus makes it hard. Peter said, just come come here, Jesus. Just come here. I'm going to rebuke you now, Jesus. Read it, it's what it says. I'm going to rebuke you. Jesus, that's never going to happen. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you, Jesus. Jesus turned with probably one of the horriblest things you can say to someone and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What just happened? Pretty amazing. Firstly, Peter rebukes Jesus, right? Disciples, first century, never rebuked their teachers. There was clearly an order, right? Yeah? Teacher, disciple. Um, In fact, there are some um, in Jewish tradition that if a disciple was caught teaching the law in front of his teacher he would be killed, right? Just don't do it. Don't mess with the order. Peter disrupts the order. Jesus says, Peter, you're my disciple. You're not the teacher, right? The word disciple literally means to follow behind, okay? To follow your teacher. And so Jesus calls Peter blessed, right? He says, you're blessed, Peter. You have the keys of the kingdom. And in the same breath, he calls him Satan, right? And he tells him to get behind him. Get behind me. Follow me, disciple. I'll lead the way, okay? You were a rock. Now you're a stumbling rock, okay? Yeah? Jesus is dissing him, right? Peter, yeah? After being one of the sort of first to be commissioned by Jesus to to build his church within seconds, Jesus calls him Satan, right? Peter betrays what God has just entrusted him with, Get behind me, Peter. Return behind me. Get to your original place as a disciple. Don't jump ahead. Don't tell me what to do. Remember earlier in sort of Matthew, Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And the third and final temptation, Satan says to Jesus, if you remember it, I will offer you all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus, if you just bow down and worship me. Satan offers Jesus the kingdom without the cross. Satan offers Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world without suffering and without the cross. 
And Peter does the same here. Yeah? He, he wants the kingdom, but he doesn't want the suffering. The thought of Jesus' sufferings blasphemous to Peter. And so Jesus calls him Satan, right? Because he no longer is looking at heaven's perspective and, and God's will, but he looks at the situation from a worldly point of view. And how often is the worldly point of view the enemy's point of view? What the enemy wants. So I want to ask us tonight, how often do we want the kingdom without the cross? How often do we want the kingdom without the cross? Peter was pretty excited. Jesus has called him a rock. He's pretty happy. Jesus said really nice things to him. You have the keys of the kingdom. But when Jesus says that he must suffer and be killed and be humiliated, Peter doesn't like it. Um, I don't think people are going to follow you, Jesus, if you're talking like this. Right? Jesus, I don't think people are going to follow you. Don't think you quite get it, Jesus. We're going to bring the kingdom. We're going to bring the king kingdom, Jesus. I don't think the church will be built on this sort of teaching. This is not what the church is going to be built on. I'm the rock. I don't think this is how I would do it, Jesus. What's Jesus' reaction to all of this? What's Jesus say? Um, how's he define what it means to follow him? Listen to what he says. It's, it's, um, it's cutthroat. Verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever, that word literally means whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple must Deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Following Jesus will cost us everything. Following Jesus will cost us everything. But at the same time, we will have everything. If we try and cling on to our lives, we will lose them. We will lose them. Jesus calls us to give everything and nothing less. And you might think, like Peter, well, that's not a very attractive gospel, is it? Follow Jesus. It might be painful and difficult, and sometimes you might not want to do it anymore. Come to Alpha, right? That's just not appealing, is it? That's just not something people want to hear. But isn't that the problem? Isn't that the problem? I think part of this problem is that so often we think the gospel, just please hear me really carefully, we think the gospel is all about us. And we might even share it with other people and as if it's all about us, right? Jesus died for me. He's come to save me. He has a plan for me. Now, nothing's wrong with these sentences. Please just listen carefully. They are correct, but sometimes don't we overemphasize ourselves? Right? It's, it's, it's not all about us. It, it involves us, but it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and his glory and his plan. It's about the work God has for us to do. It's about the work we've got to complete. And if we talk about the gospel as if it's all about us, then there's no wonder within a few months why some people just are fed up with Christianity. Because it hasn't blessed them as much as they, f they thought it would bless them. And it hasn't fixed all their problems as much as they thought it would fix all their problems. And it hasn't answered all their questions as much as they thought it would answer their questions. What if we described Christianity and the gospel, what if we said instead that it's all about Jesus? And being a Christian means we're called to follow him and walk with him. Even if it means humiliation, being mocked, 
and losing everything. Being a Christian is not what we can get out of it, right? It's about what we can give him who's given us everything. Now, again, I just want to emphasize, don't get me wrong. Yes, God blesses us. God blesses us so much, doesn't he? He gives us of his spirit, and we can worship him tonight in spirit and truth. But ultimately, we we are called to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. It's about denying ourselves. It's about giving up control. It's about being willing to lose it all for the kingdom. And isn't it, and it isn't that, it isn't that God causes suffering. He doesn't cause suffering. And it, he doesn't want us to suffer. But when we position ourselves against the way of the world, and in living for the kingdom, we open ourselves up for, for some problems. Right? When we say, I don't want to live like the world, I want to be different, we're asking for trouble. We are, we really are. Um, it's hard for us to grasp the horror of what Jesus is saying here when he talks about taking up your cross. It's, it's really difficult for us. The word cross, Greek word stauros, and, and when people heard that word in the first century, they were like disgusted and in shock. They, they didn't like it. Turn to the person next to you and with a face of utter disgust and say, did he just say stauros? No, with more disgust. That's really good, Jack. That's really good. If you're struggling, watch Jack. When Jesus says to take up your cross, your stauros, he's talking about carrying a massive wooden shaped beam on your back. And, and carrying it to your execution while crowds mocked you. That's what he's talking about. It's a disgusting and shameful picture. Um, Jesus, when he, when he describes what it means to follow him, to be a Christian, this is the picture he paints. This is what Jesus is painting. Um, Jesus didn't say, well, to follow me, this is what you need to do, okay? Get a nice house. Really nice. Yeah? two kids and a dog. Then, wait, go to church three times a month and then follow me. That's not what he says. I know that's oversimplified and a little bit stupid, but listen to what he says. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's brutal. Jesus asks us to decide, follow me, or keep your life. Gain the world and you'll lose your soul. And we can't have it both ways. It doesn't work both ways. You can't dip in and out. Take up your cross to deny yourself and to call Jesus Lord means we are vowing. We are making an oath. We're saying, whatever you say, Lord. Whatever you tell me to do. Whatever you need. Whatever you want, Jesus, I will be obedient. I'll do it, even if it means death. Because you're so worth it. You're so worth it all. Whatever you want, Jesus. I was just chatting to Charlotte on Friday night, just casual Friday night conversation. Um, What does it mean to take up our cross? What's it mean? Just casual conversation. What's it mean today in, in the UK? Now, some Christians in the world, obviously that means execution and potentially risking death, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't, there's no death penalty in the UK, right? You know, it's not illegal to be a Christian. It's not illegal to preach the gospel, it isn't. So, so, you know, we don't have that sort of thing going on. So what's it look like to you? You know, what's, what's it look like to take up your cross, to, know, to deny yourself, follow Jesus? I think it looks like a lot of things. I think it looks like your manner of living and purity. I think it looks like that. Um, what we fill our minds with, does that glorify God? Got a really long time to go, guys. So tea and coffee is... <laughs> hey, guys. Guys. Are you going for tea and coffee? Sit down, honestly. I've, I've got a while. <laughs> So 
Sorry. Just, you'd just be waiting in there for 10, 15 minutes. The, the signal is, when I say amen... No, seriously, because we're going we're gonna to listen to a song after this message. And that's, the song is seven minutes long, so that's plenty of time. What's it mean to take up our cross and follow Jesus, right? It, it means purity. It means conversation. Good conversation with people. Uplifting conversation. Encouraging. Honest. It, it includes so much tons of stuff. I'm sure you can name it. But tonight, I I just really felt that taking up your cross for us and denying yourself, I think it's about acknowledging that God does not micromanage our lives. Let me go into that a little bit. God is not a control freak. Okay? I think it's really important for us to grasp this. um, Because it will completely change what we think. And it goes against what Some of us might think. Don't get me wrong. God has a plan, doesn't he? Yes. And he's got a will and a purpose. He's all powerful. God knows the end from the beginning, but he's not a control freak. He probably isn't too concerned about who wins the World Cup, right? He probably doesn't even decide it. Can I tell you why this is really important? Because if we think God is fully in control of every aspect of our lives, then we are off the hook. And we are tempted to blame him when we make wrong decisions. God's in control. It doesn't matter how I live my life, the decisions I make. It doesn't matter that I don't know what I'm going to do after university. You know, God's in control. It just happened doesn't matter if I can't afford to pay my rent this month. God will provide. It doesn't matter if I don't revise for my exams. God will get me a (laughs) two-one. Now, we laugh, but try and just this week, try and listen out for these comments and conversations. Because sometimes you just don't see it. And people will say something, oh, God's in control. And you're like, really? Of that? I mean, two Christians... Right? Christian football teams, five aside. Okay? God, I pray that we'll win. Your will be done. Oh, God, God's got this for us. God's, God's got this for us. God's in control. Right? Who wins? What's, what's, what's God deciding there? Listen really carefully. Overall, overall, big, big picture. God has a plan, He's in control. But. He's not responsible for our actions. Okay? He's not responsible for our actions. He's in control, but he's not responsible for our actions. And um, this changes the way we live our lives. Um, because what we do matters. What we do really, really matters. Um, and this is why, partly, I think Peter freaks out when Jesus starts saying that he's going to be betrayed and crucified. This is why I think Peter freaks out. Think about it. Jesus, up until this point, has been running the show, right? People have been all sorts of diseases. Jesus heals everything, doesn't he? Yeah. People are starving and in the middle of nowhere. Jesus feeds them, right? Multiplies food. And so the disciples are thinking, we've got King Jesus, right? King Jesus is in control. And then Peter, Peter suddenly freaks out when Jesus says he's going to die and leave them. Because Peter realizes, hold on a minute, I might be responsible now. There might be some things that I'm going to be responsible for. This is down to me. No more sort of bodily Jesus here to fix everything, and we can just sit back and enjoy it. How awesome are you? We've got, we've got some serious listening to the Spirit of Christ. Yeah, we've got, we've got to really listen to God. You know, we've got responsibility God's entrusted us with something massive here. We've got to be careful how we guard it and how we work it out. The choices we make really matter. Um, And God empowers us to partner with him in bringing this kingdom. So I'm going to end with three quick points and then we'll listen to a song together and we'll reflect. Firstly, um, suffering produces fruit. 
Um, we often associate suffering with sort of like, you know, and trials as negative. Um, this wasn't always the case. Um, Christian history, suffering was kind of expected and good for your growth. And um, some people grew up, you can read about early martyrs, they would grow up and, and the parents would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be crucified for Jesus. That was what people grew up, that was my dream. Some, it wasn't always like a negative thing. Some people said, this is what I want to do with my life, right? Interesting. Acts 5, 41. The apostles, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering for Jesus. Yeah? What's Paul say? Romans 5, verse 4. We also glory in our sufferings. Glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. 1 Peter, in fact, the whole book, read 1 Peter, suffering, suffering, suffering. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come, sufferings have come, this is why they've come, so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise from you, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you, do you see? Sufferings and trials shape us. They mold us. They prove our faith. We partake in Christ's suffering. Let's rejoice. Secondly, point two. We're not helpless in suffering. In John 14, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be killed and taken away and they're just distressed and upset and sad. Jesus says, don't worry, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, someone who's going to live in you and he's going to comfort you regardless of whatever situation you find yourself. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful promise from God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul talks about his famous fawn in the flesh. Yeah, something which torments Paul, and, and, and God didn't take it away from Paul, because Paul says it stopped him becoming prideful and trusting in himself. Um, but this is what God said to Paul in his suffering. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, I will boast in my weakness, I will boast in my suffering, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's what he says. And what does Paul say? Verse 10, this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In suffering, God strengthens us, doesn't he? He makes us strong. He, he, he never leaves us. And thirdly and finally, really important, we have a greater hope. We've got a great Christian hope. Um, I don't know about you, but the promise of persecution and suffering doesn't fill me with happiness and joy. I'm not ecstatic. When I read stuff like 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It doesn't make me happy. Jesus, John 16 says, in this world, yes, Jesus, you will have trouble. Right? Take heart, I've overcome it. So um, while suffering produces fruit and while God promises to help me and give me strength, I need something else. I need hope. When all else is lost and hopeless, only Jesus can offer us hope. Only Jesus can offer us hope. Um, sometimes we forget that this age, our, you know, the time we live in, um, we forget it's just a puff of smoke. It's just a flash in the pan. Do you know when, you lo when you're watching a video on YouTube and there's the five-second advert, yeah? Then the video comes on. The five-second advert, that's like our life on earth, right? It's just, it's just, just it, goes, it goes five seconds. I know some of them like 30 seconds. Maybe that's like if you lived to 80, 85, I don't know. But, but it's just a flash in the pan, just a puff of smoke. Um, and, we, and we compromise so much and we often develop a sense of entitlement that, you know, God owes us this, doesn't he? You know? No, he doesn't. Um, God doesn't owe us anything. Um, is anyone in here, do we deserve God's grace and forgiveness? Um, but he gives it us freely anyway. We prayed for Emma tonight, a young girl in her early 20s. 
with a whole life ahead of her, taken away in an instance of injustice. Really sad. Really devastating. Life is short. But we have such a great hope. We've got such a great hope. And if we're honest, we want life easy, don't we? You know, But life isn't easy. Life isn't easy. And it isn't easy for anyone, regardless of whether you follow Jesus or not. Trouble and suffering are essential to what it means to be human. Um, it's so connected with who we are. So the question isn't, why is there suffering? The question is, what are you suffering for? That's the question. What are you suffering for? Um, some more of Paul. It's great. We can listen to it. Second Corinthians 11. Are they servants of Christ? This is Paul. I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. He can't hide. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul has a lot of stories about suffering. He's got lots of them, flogged, whipped, beaten, nearly killed multiple times. And he's still got 10 years left to live. So I'm sure he's got more stories. Um, what does, why does Paul put up with all of this? Why doesn't Paul make loads of money from his tent-making business and go and live in a nice sunny island in the Mediterranean? Right? Why, why, why does he put up with it? Acts 20, 22, Paul says this, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me. Did you get that? I'm going to Jerusalem. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but the Spirit's telling me to go there. Right? And he's obedient, so he does it. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. This is crazy. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. My life means nothing. Paul knows, doesn't he? He's got it. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for Jesus' sake will find it. Paul knows. And his motivation for undergoing persecution is that Jesus and the good news will be preached. We love Philippians 4, don't we? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? But w when you read it, what does it say? It says, these all things that Paul's talking about, he's not talking about success, he's talking about when I don't have anything, right? When I don't have anything, Christ gives me strength. When I don't have anything, when I'm persecuted, Christ gives me strength. I can do all of these horrible things because Christ gives me strength. If you want to bow your heads... And we're going to pray, but I want to read probably something that's just epic in terms of Christian hope. It's Romans 8, and it says this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. 
but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, what a a great hope we have in you. We thank you for your love for us, for your grace and your spirit poured out in our lives, in our hearts. But we acknowledge that when we declare you as Messiah Jesus, You are Lord over our lives. Jesus, you you call us to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow you. And we say sorry for the times when we believe the gospel is something that only benefits us. We acknowledge it's all about you and your glory. And we thank you for the promise of your spirit leading us in life. Regardless of what we go through, you are with us. But ultimately, God, we, we thank you for the hope the hope that is yet to be fully realized. We thank you for your kingdom where there's no weeping or sickness. We thank you that we've tasted of this kingdom, but we pray for it to come in all its fullness. We pray for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done. We we pray for your, your kingdom to come. We pray, Lord Jesus, we eagerly wait for you. We get ourselves ready. We say no to things that distract us, that waste our time. We get ourselves ready for your return, Jesus. We pick up our cross, we deny ourselves, and we follow you in this life. Let's listen to this song and reflect on it, and we'll have some tea and coffee. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. This is my word.